So thanks, everyone, for coming on this beautiful Saturday morning uh, to hear about dark matter. So uh, as a new parent, I've been singing this song a lot recently. <laughs> and I'm not going to sing it for you today, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. I'll save my singing voice for my daughter alone. But I find this song to be pretty fascinating, maybe because I've just been singing it so much late at night. But um, in particular, this word, what? And the reason is that. I have to admit, I just don't wonder what stars are. Um, and the reason is we know what stars are. Uh, but it's interesting to think about. You know, I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist, an astroparticle physicist. When I look at the sky, I think about all sorts of things. It's not that I'm not inspired by the night sky. I am certainly inspired by the night sky, and I have all sorts of questions. But amongst those questions, one is not what are stars, because we know the answer to that question. But it's, Interesting to think about the fact that when this song was written, which was not that long ago, we didn't know what stars uh, were really at all. Um, and it's only relatively recently in human history that we've actually understood what stars are. Uh, and this is something that we might not think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And imagine before people were living in big cities like Ann Arbor, where we spend most of our time inside, we, all, we have all this light pollution, you spend most of your time outside, at night, you're greeted by this magnificent sight of stars and the moon. What is this thing, the moon? And it's amazing. And then it all goes away um, in the morning, and this huge ball of flames crosses the sky for some reason. Um, and then the whole thing repeats itself at night, and you just have no idea what's going on. Um, that must have been terrifying, I think. Uh, it's kind of interesting to imagine yourself being in that position. I think it must have been terrifying, but also inspiring, um, and just beyond explanation, uh, but also very necessary. And so I think it's no surprise, if you look back in history, in prehistory, some of the earliest recorded pieces of art have to do with the stars. So for example, the Lascaux Cave um, in France, this has some of the oldest uh, cave paintings known to man. It's now thought that some of these cave paintings actually depict constellations on the sky. So this was tens of thousands of years ago. Another example of kind of astronomy influence on prehistory societies is Stonehenge, which is aligned with the summer solstice. I think my favorite example of prehistory astronomy, at least that I know of so far, is the Venus tablet from Babylonia. For some reason, someone thought it was a good idea to record the rising and setting times of the planet Venus every year for 20 years. So I have no idea why they thought this was a good idea, but they did it very diligently, and correctly, they recorded the rise and fall times of the planet Venus over 20 years. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I want to differentiate between knowing where something is on the sky and knowing what something is. So since prehistory, we've been very good at knowing where stars are on the sky. The first humans could tell you where the stars were, and they were even recording where the stars were, but that doesn't mean that they understood what they were. And I think it's not a surprise that um, throughout most of history, people associated the stars and the sun and the moon with um, divine phenomena. Because what else could this stuff be? Um, it just it, it goes beyond explanations of uh, everyday life. So, for example, astrology came out of this way of thinking. This is an astrology chart. And in astrology, you depict divine meaning to um, constellations of stars on the sky. And these constellations of stars, these stars can affect uh, life on Earth in supernatural ways. And this is a common theme throughout, uh, throughout history. You have sun gods and uh, moon gods and, and so forth. So let me now say what I think, I hope, to everyone here is going to be a very uncontroversial statement. Stars are other suns with their own planets. So this is the statement that stars are just like the sun, but they're dimmer because they're farther away. So pretty uncontroversial, right? 
So uh, this guy, Giordano Bruno, was burned at the stake in the year 1600 in Rome for making that precise statement. That's a quote from him. And he was burned at the stake because that was seen as blasphemy, as so different from the tradition up to that point. It was such a threat to the church that they had to stop this. So they burned him at the stake for making this statement, which today we all grow up just knowing that this is true, that stars are, uh, are like the sun, but they're dimmer because they're farther away. So over the preceding few hundred years, this was um, because of uh, increase in the precision of instruments, it was understood that this is actually correct, and this became uh, the accepted, uh, accepted knowledge. But at the time, and this isn't that long ago, the year 1600, this was just seen as blasphemy. So in my mind, the question of what are stars wasn't really settled until quite recently. In my mind, this, set, this question was settled around the year 1940, which really is not that long ago. That is not that long ago, the year 1940. So around the year 1940, uh, Hans Bethe and collaborators and um, contemporaries, they discovered what makes the sun hot, what makes stars hot, and what makes stars hot is nuclear fusion going on in the core of the star. This is the idea that you take two light nuclei, you fuse them together into a heavier nuclei. This releases energy. That energy is released in the core of the star. It propagates to the outside, heating this gas, making this giant ball of flames, which we see as the sun and as other stars. So it took us a long time to go from understanding where stars are on the sky to understanding what stars are. And it's only recently that we've understood uh, what, in fact, stars are. So my talk today is not on stars. It's on dark matter. But I think this is a good story to keep in mind. So dark matter is the stuff on the sky that we still really don't understand what it is. We don't understand at all what it is. Um, on the other hand, we do understand very well where it is, as I'll describe to you now. So since the early 1930s, we've understood very well where dark matter is uh, on the sky, how it's moving, and those sorts of dynamical questions. But what beast is this? Um, that's still unanswered, and that is the subject of my research, and that's the subject of this talk today. So dark matter is commonly accredited uh, to, to this guy, Fritz Zwicky, um, who is a Bulgarian astronomer who actually moved to the U.S. for most of his academic career. And if you go to his ancestral home, you'll find this plaque, and it reads, in this home was born Fritz Zwicky, the astronomer who discovered neutron stars and the dark matter in the universe. So these are two pretty good accomplishments for one person. And I just want to emphasize the date, 1933. Um, that we, we've known about the existence of dark matter for quite some time. So how did Zwicky discover dark matter? So he discovered dark matter by staring at the coma cluster of galaxies. This is a modern image of the coma cluster as taken by NASA, by the Hubble Space Telescope. So what is a cluster of galaxies? First, what's a galaxy? So a galaxy is like our own Milky Way. The Milky Way is a galaxy. You can see the Milky Way sometimes when you stare up at the night sky. And galaxies are collections of stars. Stars are like our own sun. So the Milky Way has billions of stars. Each one of these objects that you see here is a galaxy. Each one of these objects has billions of stars. And clusters of galaxies are collections of galaxies. These are the largest bound objects that we know of in our universe. So as Wiki went through the following exercise, let's imagine that the galaxies aren't moving with respect to each other. They're stationary, initially. Then what's going to happen? Gravity tries to pull everything together. That's what gravity does. So gravity is going to try to pull these galaxies towards their center. So then the image is not going to look like this because everything will collapse towards the center. So we know that there must be some motion going on to counteract that gravitational pull. On the other hand, if the galaxies are all moving really, really fast with respect to one another, they're just going to zip away, and this whole system will evaporate. We won't have that galaxy cluster today. So because galaxy clusters exist today, we know there must be some balance between the average motion of galaxies and the amount of gravitational force which is pulling these things together. 
And gravitational force is sourced by matter. The more matter, the more gravity. So by measuring the average motion of galaxies within these clusters, he was able to infer the gravitational force and the amount of matter. And he came to the very surprising conclusion, and this is a quote from his paper, if this would be confirmed, we would get the surprising result that dark matter is present in much greater amount than luminous matter. And indeed today, we know that around 90% of the matter within this particular cluster is dark matter, is non-luminous. So when you stare at this image, all you see is the luminous matter, but in fact, most of the matter here is dark matter, which is non-luminous. It doesn't interact with electromagnetism, so you can't see it when you look with your naked eye, but you can see it if you look with the correct instruments. If you look, for example, at the gravitational field instead of at the electromagnetic field. So since um, Zwicky's time, we've acquired a huge amount of evidence for the existence of dark matter. At this point, it is not a scientific question whether or not dark matter exists. We've known it exists for decades. The scientific question that remains is what is dark matter? What is this stuff? And just to emphasize how easy it is nowadays to see dark matter, so here at Michigan, this semester, I'm teaching a sophomore level uh, physics class. Um, it's a laboratory class, a laboratory introduction to quantum mechanics um, and modern physics generally. And uh, next week, for the last week of class, we will go to the top of Angel Hall. I have three hours to do this class. We'll go to the top of Angel Hall. We'll use an old radio telescope, and we will measure the dark matter content of the Milky Way. So within three hours, by going to the top of Angel Hall for a sophomore level class, we can just stare at the sky and quickly figure out the amount of dark matter in our own galaxy. It's not hard. And it's not hard because most of the stuff in galaxies and in galaxy clusters is dark matter. So if you know how to look, you don't have to look with a very sophisticated instrument. It's pretty easy to see, uh, to see dark matter. Dark matter also played a very active role in the formation of our galaxy. So even though it's non-luminous, even though it's sitting out there uh, and we can't see it, it played a very important role in the formation of our galaxy. And uh, so when you talk about the building blocks of life, um, one that often does not come to mind is dark matter. But I'm going to make a case that dark matter should be included in the biology textbooks. Because without dark matter, we would actually not have life. We would not have life as we know it. And the reason is we would have never formed galaxies and we would have never formed stars. So galaxies and stars form because of dark matter. So how is that the case? Dark matter provides the seeds for structure. So I'm gonna show you a, a movie of um, a simulation of the early stages of the universe right after the Big Bang. And what happened was, is that there were small inhomogeneities in the amount of dark matter from place to place. Those inhomogeneities collapsed under their own self-gravity. And you'll see this as, when I play that uh, animation. And they collapse and they form galaxies and they form galaxy clusters. As they're doing so, they're pulling in ordinary matter. And it's that ordinary matter which is being pulled in by the dark matter, which will then interact and form the visible parts of the galaxies and eventually stars and planets and things like us. So you can see this happen. You can see the dark matter falling in on itself, forming these compact objects. And it's those compact objects which pull in ordinary matter which become galaxies and galaxy clusters. So I can zoom in on one of these. This is a high resolution, one of the best simulations of dark matter um, that we have at the moment of a galaxy. This is a galaxy uh, very similar to our own Milky Way. What you're seeing here is the dark matter. So you can't see dark matter in real life because it's non-luminous, but we can see it in a simulation because we can do whatever we want in a simulation. So what you're seeing here is the amount of dark matter. So you can see there's all sorts of structure here. It's incredibly complicated. And we can actually see this structure when we look at the sky in the right way. When we look for the gravitational potential for gravity, for matter, instead of uh, looking for light. And this is most of galaxies. So this would be the visible part of the galaxy. This is actually to scale. So when you look up at the night sky, you see that you just see the visible galaxy. But if you look, that's when you look with your naked eye, but if you look with the right instrument, interpret the data in the right way, then you see that in fact, there's all of this other structure out there. There's all of this other stuff. And so my job is to figure out what is this stuff? And if you zoom in, 
This is a picture, uh, an, an illustration of our own Milky Way. So these are the images that you're used, to, you're used to seeing. But keep in mind, from here on out, whenever you look at images like this, in fact, there's all of this dark matter surrounding the galaxy and extending well beyond, uh, well beyond the galaxy. So what is this stuff? What is dark matter? Um, that is my job, uh, is to figure out what dark matter is. I would say I'm a dark matter hunter, if I were to give myself a job title. So I spend my day trying to think about what this stuff could be. And we have all sorts of tools to do this. I'm a theoretical physicist, so I don't build experiments. So I mostly think about either models of dark matter or ways of detecting models of dark matter or I analyze data from other experiments, um, which is what I'll be telling you about today. So we don't know much about what dark matter is, um, but we do know a lot about what dark matter is not. And we know that dark matter is not part of the known particles of nature. And here are the known particles of nature. So some of these might be familiar to you. For example, the Higgs boson got a lot of press after its discovery at CERN a few years back. That was in the news. Um, these are other ones you might be familiar with. The electron, uh, photons, this is just electromagnetism. And then the up and down quarks, maybe you haven't heard of these, but these are the constituents of the neutron and the proton. So these are the fundamental particles of nature. All the other things here are just more complicated versions of these. But what we know is that dark matter is its own beast. Dark matter is not part of the known particles of nature. It's its own thing. And the question is, what is this beast? What is this particle? And how does it fit in with the rest of the known particles of nature? So I'm going to tell you about one aspect of my work, which is looking for a specific dark matter candidate. This is a particle we don't know if it exists or not, but we're trying to figure it out. And that particle is called the axion. And I'm going to tell you how uh, we're looking for it with this experiment called abracadabra. And I'll tell you what this stands for. So this is the beast. So throughout the rest of my talk, I'm going to hypothesize that dark matter is this thing. It's an axion, and I'll tell you what the axion is. But keep in mind, we don't know if this uh, prehistoric animal uh, exists or not, if this fire-breathing dragon is real or not. That's the question that we're trying to, um, trying to figure out. So before I tell you about how we're finding the axion or trying to find the axion, I should tell you what the axion is. What is this hypothetical particle? So physicists like me, theoretical physicists, we tend to like models of dark matter when they do something for us other than just being dark matter, when they solve some other problem that exists in nature. And the axion solves another problem in nature. It was actually hypothesized not as a solution uh, to the dark matter problem, but as a solution to another problem. And that problem is called the neutron electric dipole moment problem. And I want to explain that problem to you now. But to explain that problem to you, I first need to tell you what an electric dipole moment is. What is an electric dipole moment? And a good illustration of this uh, comes from water. So here's water, H2O. Um, water has a charge asymmetry. You might have learned this in, in chemistry way back when. So there are more plus charges on the hydrogen side and more minus charges on the oxygen side. So in total, it is charge neutral, but the charge is distributed in a slightly asymmetric way. And that induces what's called an electric dipole moment. Electric dipole moments point from the negative side to the positive side. So what do they do? Let's imagine that we put water in an electric field. What is going to happen? It's charge neutral, so it's not going to translate, but it's going to rotate. And it's going to rotate because the plus charges want to get pushed by the electric field. On the other hand, the minus charges want to go in the other direction. They feel the exact opposite forces to this electric field. So what that's going to cause the water molecule to do is to rotate and align itself such that this dipole is aligned with the electric field. So this is what dipole moments do. So now I'm just going to repeat that same procedure with the neutron. But first, let's just remind ourselves what neutrons are. So I'm going to zoom in on oxygen. So what's oxygen? Oxygen is an atom with uh, 
about eight elect with eight electrons, and a nucleus, nucleus with charge plus eight. So to zoom in on that nucleus, what's in the nucleus? The nucleus has protons and neutrons. The protons have charge plus one, electric charge, and the neutrons are neutral. That's why they're called neutrons. So let's zoom in on the neutron. Uh, well, first, actually, what happens if we put a proton electric field, just to make sure that everyone is awake? If we put a proton electric field, it just uh, zooms away. Okay, that's very boring, so let's not do that. Uh, instead, I'm going to put a neutron in the electric field, because neutrons are neutral, so they're not going to zip away. They're going to rotate, or maybe they'll rotate. But what's in a neutron? Neutrons have quarks. These are the things I mentioned before. They have, the neutron actually has one up quark and two down quarks. The up quarks have fractional charge plus two-thirds. The down quarks have fractional charge minus one-third. So in total, this thing is charge neutral, but we expect there to be a charge asymmetry, just like there was for water. This is a, just an exact analog of water. So what do we expect to happen if we put a neutron in an electric field? We expect that it's going to rotate and align itself with that electric field. That was the expectation before people did this experiment. Then people did this experiment and the neutron did not rotate. And this was very confusing and this is what's called the neutron electric dipole moment problem. So I need to explain this at a little bit of a more specific level to tell you how the axion solves this problem. So in fact, it's a little bit more complicated. These quarks are bound together in the nucleus, in the neutron, by the strong force. The strong force has a fundamental parameter of nature, which is called theta. What are fundamental parameters of nature? Let me just explain by example. Another one is the speed of light. Speed of light is the fundamental constant of nature. The gra Newton's gravitational constant is a fundamental constant of nature. The mass of the electron is a fundamental constant of nature. You can think that the mass of the proton, in some sense, is also a fundamental constant of nature. So these are things, we don't know why they take the values that they do, but they happen to take some specific value. This is another fundamental constant of nature. This fundamental constant of nature controls this charge asymmetry. It controls how strong that dipole moment is. And it turns out that the bigger this value of theta, the faster that neutron is going to rotate in the electric field, the bigger the, the, bigger the charge asymmetry. If this parameter happened to be exactly zero, there would be no charge asymmetry and the neutron would not rotate. And what's observed in nature is that in fact we live in this case. So if it was bigger than zero, you would expect the neutron to rotate, but that's not what's observed in nature. This is observed, so we infer that this parameter is zero. And the question is, why did this parameter take on the specific value? So let me just make this a bit more explicit. This fundamental constant of nature, we expected it to take values from minus pi to pi. That's about minus three to three. And we happen to live in a universe where it's exactly zero. Well, it's not exactly zero. We know from our experiments that it's at least one part in 10 billion close to zero. That's very close to zero. So we expected this parameter to be somewhere between minus pi to pi, and it happens to be one part in 10 billion away from zero. And the question is, why? Why is this parameter so close to zero? So what would I have thought would happen? I, I would have thought that I would randomly choose a value. So let me just randomly choose a value for this parameter. It might land over there. If I do it again, it might land over there. And I can keep on doing this, but I'm going to have to do it 10 billion times before I finally find something, which lands in that box. So let's not go through this 10 billion times. Um, and we hope that nature also didn't go through this 10 billion times because there's no reason for this parameter to have taken that value. So as physicists, we are trained to identify problems like this. This is drilled into us in our education to find problems like this. These are called tuning problems. And we're trained to find problems like this because they often, um, they often nature does not work this way. They often uh, are a hint that there's something more fundamental going on, something deeper, that we just don't understand yet. And uh, so people got very excited when they saw this problem because it was a hint that something deeper might be going on. So the axion is a proposed solution to this problem. And it was hypothesized by Roberto Pecci and Helen Quinn back in 1977. 
And so what they notice is that this flat line is actually tilted. So when you randomly pick one of these values of, of theta, you can think of putting a ball on a hill, and that ball is staring down at the bottom of the hill. The neutron would be in a lower energy configuration if it just rolled down to zero. So it really wants to get down to zero. But you can think of it as a ball on a hill, uh, and it's a very um, rough surface, and that ball can't roll. There is no way within the known laws of nature for this parameter to change. So it wants to go down to the bottom of the hill, but it just can't. So they hypothesize a new particle, which is called the axion, and the role of this particle is to allow uh, this ball to roll down to the bottom of the hill. So you can think of it, this axion, as providing a layer of oil over top of this hill, and then, in the presence of this particle, this parameter can roll down to the bottom of the hill and take on the observed value, which is very close to zero. So what they hypothesize is that when you look at a neutron, there are quarks, they're bound together by the strong force, but there's also this new beast, there's also this new particle inside of the neutron, which is called the axion. And this particle, its job is to prevent the neutron from rotating in electric fields. So this happened around 1977. It was later realized, not too long afterwards, that these particles don't just exist bound up inside of neutrons. They're also created abundantly, just like the other particles of nature, after the Big Bang. And so you have this situation where, yes, the axions, uh, these beasts are bound up inside of neutrons, but if you work out the, the theory, which people did in the early 1980s, you see that they're created abundantly in the Big Bang, and they actually make up dark matter. So they explain the observed dark matter of our universe. So when you look at a picture like this, in fact, if the axion is actually in nature, then all of this stuff that you see are just collections of these particles called axions. So this might sound like a very appealing theory. So why don't we know if it's true or not? We don't know if it's true or not because it's really hard to see. Other than solving this one problem with the neutron, the axion interacts extremely weakly with the, S, the rest of the forces of nature. So as I'll tell you, the axion is not completely dark. It does interact very weakly with electromagnetism, but very weakly. So it's extremely hard to see. And so the technology just hasn't been out of place. And the ideas for trying to detect these things haven't been out of place um, to really test this model until now. And today, we're at the stage where we can actually test this model, where we can see if this is what's going on or not. And so that's what I want to really get to um, today. But first, I need to tell you a little bit more about, um, about this beast, about axions, as dark matter. So one very important property of particles in general, and of the axion specifically, is its mass. So the axion turns out to be really light. So let me work in units where the proton has a mass of one. The electron turns out to be about a thousand times lighter than the proton. The proton is quite heavy. So the electron is about a thousand times lighter. The axion, if you work out the, the theory, you see is way lighter than all of these. I don't know what number this is. It's one over one with a lot of zeros. You can count the zeros, a lot of zeros. It's a very light particle. This, if it exists, would be the lightest particle that we know of in nature. And this is just a consequence of working out the, the theory. So what does that mean when we talk about axions as dark matter? So what we measure in astrophysics, what we're gonna measure next week in my lab, for example, is the amount of dark matter within a fixed volume. So let's imagine that the dark matter mass is represented by the size of a circle, and it's this. So we might have three balls within some box. But if the dark matter mass was smaller, then we would need to have more balls because we have to have the total amount of, of the total amount of mass is fixed within this volume. So as we decrease the size of the particle, we need to have more and more of these particles. So it gets smaller and smaller. We need to have more and more and more of them um, within a fixed volume. And at some point, it just stops making sense to talk about particles anymore, and we should instead use the language of fluids. 
So when we talk about the ocean, we don't say, oh, I'm going to jump into this collection of water molecules. That's not the way you think of it. You think of it as a fluid. Um, because there are so many water molecules that it just doesn't make sense to talk about the individual particles under most circumstances. So that for the same reason, when we talk about axions, we often use the language of fluids and not the language of particles. Um, and it's just it's not for any profound reason. There's just so many of them that you can't really keep track of the individual ones. So the axion really does behave like a fluid. Um, so here I'm going to show you a simulation from my group of what we expect this axion fluid to look like in the vicinity of Earth. And this is to scale. So what I'm going to show you is a two-dimensional slice through, uh, the, through space near Earth. And on the vertical axis is the amount of mass, or the energy density, or mass density, within the dark matter. So what you can see is this is really like a wavy ocean. There's a lot of really complicated stuff, really violent stuff, going around in this dark matter all around us. And this is to scale. So if this model is true, then there are axion dark matter waves crashing into Earth all of the time. In this room, there is this turbulent sea of dark matter coming back and forth, waves crashing all of the time. But we can't see any of this. We can't see any of this because the axion interacts so weakly with ordinary matter. It is so dim that you can't make any of this out with your eye or even with sophisticated instruments. But this is what we're trying to detect. We're trying to detect this violent sea of dark matter all around us. So there is hope. There is hope of knowing if this theory is correct or not. Um, and this is how, um, this is how we're trying to, to see uh, axions. So it turns out that axions interact very weakly with electromagnetic um, radiation in the following way. Let's imagine we have an axion wave, which is just hanging around, and it encounters a magnetic field. So it encounters a magnetic field. What's going to happen? Well, for the most part, it'll just go straight through, and nothing will happen. Because an axions interact so weakly with electromagnetism that uh, 9 times out of 10, or 9 billion times out of 10, it's just going to, or 9 billion times out of 10 billion, or 9 billion out of 9 billion in 1, or something, whatever the correct version of that uh, analogy is, is going to go straight through. <coughs> but every once in a while, you're going to create an electromagnetic wave. So they're not completely dark. So electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation, this is like visible light, I'll talk more about this, or radio waves or gamma waves, gamma rays. These are examples of electromagnetic radiation. So when an axion wave hits a magnetic field, for the most part, it just goes straight through, but it might create a really small electromagnetic wave. And those are the waves that we're going to be trying to look for, because these are things that we can look for with, for example, our telescopes. So when you talk about electromagnetic waves, there's an important quantity that we use to characterize the wave. And that is frequency, or wavelength. This is how we characterize electromagnetic waves. This is how we differentiate between radio waves, for example, and gamma rays. So when you see this diagram, this illustration, the first question that you might want to ask is, what is the frequency of this electromagnetic wave? Is it a gamma ray, or is it a radio wave? So I'm going to answer that with a sequence of three equations. The first equation is why Einstein's so famous. E equals mc squared. And I'm going to apply it here to the axion wave. So the energy in this wave, in an axion particle which makes up this wave, is given by the mass of this particle, which I said was really small, times the speed of light squared. That's what Einstein told us. We also know that energy is conserved in our universe. So when an axion particle converts into an electromagnetic wave particle, which is what we call the photon, the energy of that photon equals the energy of the axion. There's another formula, which may be familiar to some of you. This relates the energy of photons, the energy of electromagnetic waves, to the frequency of the wave. So this formula 
was hypothesized by Max Planck. H here is another fundamental constant of nature, which is called Planck's constant. This is actually the equation that won Max Planck the Nobel Prize, and also really won Einstein the Nobel Prize. So even though uh, in kind of everyday life, Einstein is so famous for this equation, his Nobel Prize relates much more to this equation than it does to this equation. So this is a very important equation. So this equation tells us how to relate the frequency of electromagnetic radiation to the energy of electromagnetic radiation. And this might be in intuitive if you think of gamma rays, which are really high frequency of having high energy. Whereas radio waves are very low frequency, they have very little energy. And this is quantified through this equation. So if I combine these three equations, I can relate the frequency through this to the mass of the axion. And I discovered that the frequency of the electromagnetic wave is equal to the mass of the axion times some fundamental constants of nature. OK, so now we know how to do this. Then you just have to put in the numbers. And so where does it fall? So first, let's just orient ourselves with electromagnetic radiation. So here is the frequency spectrum of electromagnetic radiation going from the radio band to microwaves, infrared, and then visible light. And visible light, on the lower frequency side, you have redder colors. And on the higher frequency side, you have bluer and then violet colors. So where, does, where do axions sit here? Turns out that axions are kind of in between the radio and microwave bands. For whatever reason, that's where they end up. So there is where we should be looking uh, for this beast, the axion. So the first thing that might come into mind after this story is, well, there are magnetic fields in the galaxy. So maybe if the axion exists and I look with radio telescopes or microwave telescopes at the sky, I can see a very dim amount of light coming from this dark matter converting into electromagnetic radiation within the magnetic, magnetic fields of our galaxy. And so you might expect that if you look really hard, and you stare really hard, that you'll see this dark matter emerge. You'll see it emerge uh, with normal telescopes, with normal, uh, for example, radio telescopes. And actually, this is part of what my group does here at Michigan. We use very big, very sophisticated radio telescopes. We point them in the sky, and we try to see if dark matter is, in fact, not dark, but emitting a very small amount of light. But that's not what I'm going to tell you about right now. I want to tell you about how we can look for axions in the laboratory. So in addition to being out in the cosmos, as I showed you in that animation, there should also be dark matter within uh, an Earth, within this room. You can't feel it because it interacts so weakly with us, but there should be this whole fluid in the room. And there should also be fluids, axion fluids, if you go into the basement, into our laboratories because the dark matter doesn't interact with matter very strongly. So it can go straight through Earth and out the other side, or it could go straight through the ceiling and down into our underground laboratories. So I want to tell you about an, uh, an experiment of mine, which is called Abracadabra. It stands for a Broadband Resident Approach to Cosmic Axion Detection with an Amplifying B-Field Ring Apparatus. So it is quite the mouthful. Uh, <laughs> Certainly, we did not choose this to have that acronym. It just magically uh, appeared that way. <laughs> so what is this experiment, Abracadabra? So this was an idea that I came up with with some of my theoretical colleagues when I was at MIT uh, back in 2016. And we were at the board trying to figure out ways of detecting this particle, of detecting the axion. And we came up with the following idea. Uh, that I want to tell you about now. So the idea is that we're going to start with a toroidal magnetic field. So I told you that axions can convert into electromagnetic radiation in the presence of a magnetic field. So before I get into the details, all we're going to do is put in a really big magnetic field, wait for the axions to come hit it, and then look for that electromagnetic radiation that's produced. Um, coming out the other side. But we're going to do it with a very specific geometry. And so this is the geometry. We're going to create a magnetic field, a toroidal magnetic field, 
which is a magnetic field that goes around in a circle. And I'm going to demonstrate this for you, just to make it clear. So here is a piece of wire that looks almost exactly like our experiment. I'm going to show you uh, real pictures of our experiment, and you'll be shocked how similar it looks to this wrapped piece of wire. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a current through this wire, and that current is going to source a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to go in a circle. So to show you this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some iron filings down on top of this wire, and then I'm going to turn on the current. This is an electromagnet, and the current is going to create this magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to go around in a circle through this toroid. So let me do that. So now I'm turning on the current, and you can see that all of the iron filings lined up with the magnetic field lines. So you can see the geometry of magnetic field that we've created. The magnetic field goes in around in a circle to the inside of the toroid, and it does not exist outside of the toroid. You can see outside of the toroid, the, the iron filings are pointing in random directions. It's only within the toroid that we have the magnetic field that goes around it in a circle. Okay, so that's um, kind of step number one. And then uh, if we go back to the slides, What we notice is that uh, in the presence of this magnetic field, if axions exist, if axion dark matter exists, so axion dark matter is here in the room, what happens is you induce an effective electric current. And that electric current follows these magnetic field lines. So you can think the axion dark matter in the presence of this magnetic field is inducing its own current. It's a very small current, but it's inducing its own current, and that current wraps around in a circle. And currents generate magnetic fields. That's what I just showed you. That when we, I turned on the power, I generated a magnetic field. So now axion dark matter has turned on the power in some sense, and it's going to generate its own magnetic field. But that magnetic field is going to point in a different direction. That magnetic field will pierce the center of the toroid. And this is a real magnetic field that's going to come in and out of the plane that I was just demonstrating. So if axions are dark matter, that was actually happening. That was happening right there. But the magnetic field is going to be so small that you need really sophisticated instruments to try to see it. So we detect this small magnetic field using a process called magnetic induction. Um, and the point here is that this magnetic field is oscillating at this frequency, which is in the radio or the uh, microwave band. So I told you that axions in the presence of magnetic fields convert to electromagnetic radiation. And so you might be confused why I'm talking about magnetic fields and not electromagnetic radiation. Well, what is electromagnetic radiation? It's oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So there's an oscillating electric and magnetic field, and we're just trying to detect the magnetic field part, because it turns out we're better at measuring magnetic fields than electric fields. So we're trying to measure this oscillating magnetic field. We do so by putting in a loop of wire connect to a device which measures current. Wires do not like magnetic fields to be changed inside of them. And so if you try to change the magnetic field through a loop of wire, then a current will be induced within the loop to try to counter that magnetic field. And I can demonstrate this for you right now. This is a, a very important process, magnetic induction, um, for technology in our modern day world. This is how transformers work. This is how inductors work. Modern technology would not exist without this phenomena that I'm going to illustrate to you now. So I have a conducting loop. It's actually a conducting cylinder. And it's connected to a device which measures current. So let me take my permanent magnet. This is going to be my proxy for my axion-induced magnetic field. And let me bring it in and out. You can see I've induced a current. I'm not touching anything. I'm just changing the magnetic field through the center of this, of this toroid and I'm making a needle move back and forth. And that needle is measuring the current in this wire. So that's exactly what we do, except we don't use this thing, because this thing is not very good. I mean, it works if you have a massive permanent magnet like that, but for the sorts of currents that we're, sort of currents we're looking for, we need a much more uh, sensitive device. So, if I can find it. 
find where I put my pointer. Good. So we put some device to measure the current. So this happened back in 2016, but we were a bunch of, of theoretical physicists. We didn't, none of us knew how to actually build something. That wasn't our job. So when you think of a theoretical physicist, when you think of a scientist, you probably don't think of a person like me. We are at our computers. Maybe we're working on supercomputers, but you don't see that. We're just at our laptops. And, uh, or we're at the chalkboard, and it looks like we're drawing. drawing. So when you think of a scientist, you think of someone like Lindley. So Lindley is a real experimental high energy physicist. Um, she builds big, expensive, fancy experiments that do real good science. Uh, luckily, we were at MIT, and Lindley was just down the hall from us. So we walked over, we asked her very nicely if she would build our experiment. We convinced her that it was a good idea, and um, eventually she, she decided that this was a worthwhile thing to do, and we formed the Abracadabra Experimental Collaboration, and here are some of the experimentalists um, which were involved in building this experiment. So this is an illustration of what our actual experiment looks like. So we have this, this is a cross section through the toroid. You can see that there's wires wrapping around which generate that magnetic field. And then our pickup loop is right in the center. So that's what we're going to use to try to detect that uh, magnetic field. And we close the whole thing up into what looks like a donut, which everyone has experience with because there were some out before my talk. So this experiment takes place in the middle of Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a very busy place. And we're essentially building a radio. And so we don't want to hear how the Red Sox are doing or <laughs> listen to NPR. So we need to block all of that stuff out. And we do that by using what's called a Faraday cage. And everyone here should be familiar with Faraday cages because um, you've probably walked into an elevator on the phone and then suddenly you can't hear the other person on the other side. That's because you've walked into a big metal box, and that metal box is screening electromagnetic radiation from entering in. So we do that, but we do that much better. We use a better piece of metal. We use what's called a superconductor. And superconductors are really good at blocking electromagnetic radiation. So we surround our sensitive detector with a superconducting shield that blocks out NPR, that blocks out the red socks, that blocks out anything else that's going on. So this is what our experiment looks like. So we have the superconducting shield. And that wire coming out is where we actually measure the, the signal. And if you open it up, you have some casing which holds our toroid. And we can take that casing away. And you can see our donut. So there's that toroid. This is constructed of pieces of plastic with wires wrapped around it. And those wires are used to generate the current to generate our primary toroidal magnetic field. And we have many wrappings of that wire because we want a really strong magnetic field. So our magnetic field is much stronger than the magnetic field that I showed you in our demonstration. So all of these wires are quite close together. And in between them are just pieces of plastic. And then we put our toroid back in its casing. There's our pickup loop in the middle. Put a little cylinder in it just to essentially hold it in place. And then the whole thing goes back together. So we put the donut back together. And then put it back in its superconducting shield. So that, um, that's what our experiment looks like. The whole thing is quite small. It's actually 10 centimeters big. That fits in the palm of my hand. This is a handheld dark matter detector. So that looks really cool, right? But this might look less cool. This is what our experiment actually looks like when we built it. <laughs> so you can see there's glue and tape and all sorts of things. Even though it's a very expensive experiment, you still don't get around uh, glue and tape. So there's our superconducting shield. And you can see the donut. You can see the wires uh, in there as well. Then we put the whole thing in an even bigger shield, which is what you see here. And then we put the whole thing in a refrigerator. This is a, actually a refrigerator. It doesn't look like your refrigerator. Uh, but it gets much colder. It gets down close to absolute zero. Um, but it doesn't have its walls on it. So we put walls on it before we actually cool it down. So the experiment is physically located in a basement at MIT. 
But what happens is we take a lot of data, and that data is shipped a few times per day straight to us here in Ann Arbor, where we store it and analyze it on supercomputing facilities here uh, at the University of Michigan. So what is this thing that we're looking for? What we're looking for is we're looking for the current as a function of time. We're trying to see this oscillating current induced within the pickup loop. So I can play you what a simulation of what we expect the signal to look like. So you see we have this oscillating current. And if I zoom out and look over bigger and bigger time scales, I see that there's also some oscillations on large time scales. So on small time scales, I have these rapid oscillations at, the, at radio or, mega or uh, microwave frequencies. But if I zoom out, I have these bigger oscillations. So here is a zoomed out picture at, um, at, at, on large time scales. What's modulating the amplitude is the dark matter density. So all of those waves that I talked about before that are crashing into, into the laboratory, those modulate the amplitude of our signal. So this is an amplitude modulated signal at a specific frequency. That's exactly how AM radios work. So AM radio stands for amplitude modulation. So you transmit a signal at a specific frequency, but then the actual thing you want to listen to, you put that into the amplitude. You modulate the amplitude of that, uh, of that wave. That's exactly what nature is doing for us here. So um, this is what our signal sounds like if you just put it through, a, uh, through an AM radio. So I simulated our signal, and I literally put it through the circuitry of an AM radio. So what you're hearing here is this turbulent axion C, or a simulation of that turbulent axion C. So let me just play this for you again, maybe. No, oh, going the wrong direction now. So you can hear a frequency. If you listen closely, you can hear a specific frequency. That is the frequency at which these axion waves are crashing into the laboratory. So you're really, this provides a way of listening to this turbulent sea all around us. That frequency is the frequency of waves crashing against the shore. So just like uh, with a normal radio, what makes this experiment so hard is that we don't know the frequency. So imagine you're driving down the highway, and you're in a new town, and you want to listen to Michigan radio or NPR or something. And, but you don't know what frequency it's at. So what are you going to do? You're going to be tuning your radio, and then you're going to sit on a station, and you're going to wait. Maybe it's an ad or something. It's, you don't know. Then you have to wait. OK, that's not it. I change the station. I wait. Then I change the station. I wait. And it's a slow process. We have to do literally the same thing because we don't know the frequency that we're looking for. We know it's somewhere within this radio to microwave band, but that covers many, many orders of magnitude of possible frequencies. So we do the, exactly the same thing that you do. We tune the frequency of our radio, we listen, we change the station, we listen, we change the station, and we're looking to hear exactly what I just played for you. Except we don't listen to it, we put it through our computers, but that's morally what we're doing. We're just listening to see if it's the right station. In fact, the experiment that we're doing would be way easier if we knew this station. So people joke uh, in this field that if you, um, once we detect axion dark matter, it'll become a college level laboratory experiment, like the sort of one that I'm doing uh, next week on top of Angel Hall where we're gonna measure the dark matter density. Because once you know the frequency, it's actually not that hard to see this. Um, to see the signal, the thing that makes it so hard right now is that we don't know the frequency. And so since we don't know the frequency, we have to scan over all of these possibilities. And we have to be able to do that fast. So we need to have a very sensitive detector. So we built an experiment. It's called Abracadabra 10 centimeters. It's a 10 centimeter detector. That literally fits in the palm of my hand. It's a hand-sized uh, dark matter detector. We did not find dark matter. And we didn't find dark matter because we didn't expect to find dark matter because the toroid was too small. We weren't sensitive enough. But we wanted to demonstrate that this technology is possible. 
Um, and we wanted to demonstrate that it was possible so that we could eventually build a bigger version. And so we, just a few months ago, we successfully put out our first paper demonstrating that this technology is possible. And now we are gearing up to build a bigger version, which will be Abra 1 meter instead of 10 centimeters, so about 10 times bigger. And that will be sense enough, sensitive enough to start testing the real axion, to start looking for axions. At that point, we might actually find something. And that's happening um, over the next few years. Uh, that program should be taking place. So I want to give you some sense for how small this signal is, how hard it is to actually see this. Why can we not use this device here up at the front that, um, that measures current to look for our signal? So the power draw, you can think of axions as a little mini power plant. You can think of our experiment as a miniature power plant. We're taking energy out of these axion waves and converting it into electricity, kind of like a solar panel. So how good do we do? Well, the power draw from dark matter is such that with our little experiment, you would need 10 to the 24 of these experiments to power a light bulb. So 10 to 24 is a really big number. That's a number that's too big to comprehend. That's 10 with 24 zeros after it. How big is that number? If you covered the entire surface of the Earth with abracadabras, so there was no square inch of land that was safe from us putting down one of our experiments, and you connected them all together and put them into a light bulb, that would not come close to powering the light bulb. If you then decided to dig down and actually fill the entire volume of the Earth with our experiment, that would still not come close to lighting a single light bulb. So a light bulb is a really bad way of looking for our signal. <laughs> so instead, we use very sophisticated technology. Actually, technology that's quite similar to the technology that you'll find uh, in an MRI machine in, in a hospital. We use very sophisticated technology to look for these tiny magnetic fields, to look for these tiny currents that, we are, um, that we're generating. And hopefully, over the next few years, we'll have some good news to share with you and maybe a discovery of dark matter. Um, but we're not alone. There's actually a race right now going on around the world to try to detect axion dark matter. So we are one part of this race. Uh, there are experiments literally all over the world and observatories all looking to try to find this particle. The race is on to try to detect um, this particle. But I want to end on a bit of a more pessimistic note, or a little, at least a more cautionary note. So remember, it took us essentially the whole course of humanity up until now, tens of thousands of years, to understand what stars are. Even though we knew where they were on the sky. But it took us tens of thousands of years to understand what was actually going on inside of them. So relatively speaking, we have just discovered what dark matter is. We discovered or what, where dark matter is. We've just discovered the existence of dark matter about 100 years ago. And it's possible that we're just beginning the, the, search, the dis search for dis discovering actually what it is. So I hope we'll have good news in the next three years, the next five years, the next 10 years. But as scientists, we have to be prefer prepared for the possibility that it could be 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. We have to be prepared for that possibility because we just don't know. We don't know what this beast is. So on that cautionary note, um, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks for coming out.